Welcome to the first edition of the EPIC Conversations. EPIC Conversation is an initiative by EPIC Foundation to bring the global leaders to discuss the developing India as a powerhouse in electronics products and semiconductor products. Uh, today's discussion is focused on making India as a product nation for electronics and semiconductor products. Uh, to put in the perspective, I would refer to a famous dialogue from Indian film Diwar. Uh, mere paas ma hai. So, today India has market, India has manpower and India has manufacturing, but the pa is missing, the products are missing. So, today we are going to talk about how to make India as a product nation and to discuss this we have two of the tallest leaders of electronics and semiconductor industry, uh, Dr. Ajay Chaudhary, uh, founder of HCL and Mr. Vinod Dham, properly known as uh, father of the Pentium processor, a semiconductor veteran. So, I welcome you to this discussion about making India as a product nation. So, I will start with the a broader uh, question. Uh, India is aspiring to become a 5 trillion dollar economy in next 5 to 7 years and out of that 1 trillion dollar economy is going to be digital economy. So, uh, so, question to Ajay sir, how do you see the role of electronics in driving this 1 trillion dollar digital economy, so that we can become uh, a uh, electronics nation? So, basically the way I look at it is that electronics will occupy between 30 to 40 percent of this 1 trillion economy. And I expect that the electronics business from India, whether it is domestic or exports, would be somewhere between 300 to 400 billion dollars, closer to 400 billion. So, I think there is a great opportunity for India to achieve that 1 trillion digital dream with electronics as a very major part of that. And within this will be of course, the semiconductor piece also. That Vinod sir, your view that how semiconductor will power this 1 trillion dollar digital economy? Well, semiconductor is the basic uh, foundation for all of the electronics and uh, the cost of importing semiconductor is very, very high. So, if you want to create a digit, uh, local domestic trillion dollar economy, we will have to manufacture some of these things internally, domestically. Uh, so, little bit going in the history, uh, in 80s and 90s, India had many electronics product companies in an electronics brand. But today, if we see, although we are manufacturing large amount of electronics, but there are hardly any Indian electronics product companies or electronics brands which are left over and the decline over the next three decades is very clearly seen. So, how do you see what caused uh, this decline of uh, uh, India's electronics ecosystem which was pretty vibrant in 80s and 90s? In the 70s, 80s, the government policy was clearly to support uh, design and development of products. And there was a program which was called phased manufacturing program under which the government used to encourage people to add value in India, which drove the design ecosystem and then the product ecosystem and hence huge amount of Indian brands got created, whether you look at computers, you look at white goods, you look at televisions, whole bunch of Indian brands got created. And then the government uh, in, uh, in its own uh, way came in and signed the WTO agreement on electronics and IT. And as a result of that, the whole market was opened up to global competition. When the global competition entered, the government had really not done enough work to help preserve that ecosystem. 
and hence the slowly slowly various brands started vanishing and there was no real uh, strategy to support Indian brands because there are a lot of areas in which India lacks. Cost of money is very high, logistics is poor, cost of power etc. is high. All these combined to make huge amount of disability factors and those were not taken care of so that we could have easily competed with any global brand but all this was not taken care of and then there were very serious inverted duty issues also. So, all this combined to, uh, to the in a manner decimation of the electronics industry a lot of small and medium companies got affected and they all closed down. So, that has been the serious decline of Indian brands during that period. Okay. I have a slightly a different perspective as well. I think the other thing that happened that is not visible um, in an open way is that in the 90s, uh, the IT began to take hold and the IT is a service industry and it is a highly uh, profitable and highly de-risked industry. Uh, it All it takes is a person with a computer to sit down and start writing a code and you can make 50 percent profit on it. Manufacturing is a much more uh, longer term, longer return on investment, more complicated uh, issue that requires also a lot of scale which IT does too and that is why we have Infosys, DCS and Wipro amongst many others. And I think uh, the Indian enterprise and businessmen found the easy way out and in my study I have seen a lot of people who are doing both manufacturing and wanted to do into software, they ended up just doing software because that was easy way to make money. Okay. So, a lot of people say that uh, the IT revolution which you are talking about was catalyzed by Y2K. Mm. Uh, that basically created opportunity for IT service industry. Mm -hmm. Do you see a similar catalytic event for electronics and semiconductor in the current scenario? See, I have a perspective on that. If you study Y2K, see, con companies like Infosys and Wipro have existed for long, for a very long time. Uh, they were not known to the outside world. So, they really did not take off till almost the beginning of this century. In an international manner, I am talking about. They may be doing things here in India, but they were really mm. not big players. And you can go back and trace their revenues in history, and I have done that. I think Infosys started in 82. Not till the Y2K happened did the US companies, I can speak about US because I was in US, that panicked into making sure that the software programs that were written for 50, 60 years would not suddenly expire on the date of uh, 2031st December, did they start uh, requesting a lot of engineers from India to come to US to look at their code. So, it was a perfect storm. I will tell you the three uh, segments of that storm. One was the Y2K, so need for engineers and Indian had a lot of talent. So, they brought them in to change the code and they suddenly realized that these kids are not just changing the code, they are updating the code, they are modifying the code, they are making the code better that they were not simply, you know, snake charmers, they were actually very smart engineers. That was some major recognition on behalf of US industry to say, these guys are pretty talented people. Second thing that happened was what we call dot bomb. The dot bomb after dot com suddenly happened when this so-called dream of new economy that everything will happen through internet overnight disappeared. Most of these companies that were using our engineers for Y2K, suddenly their valuations came down to one third of where they were. So, cost became a very important element of their being profitable again. And to reduce cost, they looked at the same engineers who had done just the work for them to go back and now do the actual work of development, sustenance, maintenance, whatever work that they needed to do. That is when large scale 
migration of software work from outside like US started coming to India. And the third leg of this entire activity that really helped create a perfect storm in favor of India was the fact that there were companies like Global Crossing, for example, that had laid out for billions and billions of dollars uh, undersea cables to connect Mumbai, for example, as a, uh, a spot to a US, San Francisco, for internet. Internet had just become uh, more commercial in the mid-95 to 2000 with the advent of Netscape browser technology. And that allowed then the Indian engineers sitting in Bangalore to be connected to the American engineers sitting in San Francisco or New York to be just connected real time. That wasn't possible until then, by the way. So the transition of these three activities, connectivity, Y2K, and need for the American industry to go back to find lower cost opportunities really helped IT take off like a, a big bang. Are, are we sitting on the something similar in electronic semiconductor today based on the all geopolitical things which are happening today? Do we have a Y2K moment for electronics and semiconductor today, do you see that opportunity has been created at this Absolutely, point of the time? Absolutely, because the way you see the situation, geopolitical situation, everyone is now looking at an alternative to China. And nobody wants a, a situation to be repeated where supply chains get spoiled. So hence, as a result of that, everybody is looking at an alternative and a resilient supply chain. In addition to all the things that have happened geopolitically, the Ukraine war and the recent zero COVID policy of China is also deterring people for just going to China. So I think this is a terrific opportunity for India to step in because Vietnam stepped in when there was this discussion of China plus one. And Vietnam did brilliantly at what they did. We were too slow. We didn't, we didn't do it. But now the situation is that you need both design talent as well as manufacturing. So India in the last couple of years has grown manufacturing in a big way in India. The design capability that sits here is going to be the key differentiator between India and Vietnam. And therefore, I think this is a moment we must seize. See, although I completely agree with Ajay, he very eloquently put down this enormous window of opportunity we have because China is beginning to not only be suffering from the zero COVID policy, which is more of a tactical issue, however long it lasts. I think strategically, they've decided to now pull themselves, focus themselves inwards. For the last 40 years, they were focused outwards. Now they're going inwards and working on their own domestic, which has opened up an opportunity for us. Like he said, the world is in turmoil. We are there with a great talent pool. <coughs> and uh, a new government, uh, I would give a lot of credit to uh, Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji for having the vision under the umbrella of Atmanirbhar to start focusing also on the electronic side of the world to say how do we create self-sufficiency at least for our own domestic economy if not start exporting and become the largest exporter in the world and then folks like uh, Ashwini ji and Rajiv ji both of them are domain experts in their own field they have done uh, electronics in their background so they are not necessarily just uh, folks who are political leaders who are pursuing a certain path they have some understanding of what it is take to put together uh, policies and framework and people to go do that. However, I must say, I have been uh, coming here for 47 years and we've been described as a tiger in the cage and the tiger has to be unleashed and now the tiger is unleashed and the tiger has been in cage for so long that it doesn't know how to run. So it needs to be uh, trained, it needs to be nourished, it needs to be all these issues of tariffs and duty structures and regulatory things and I know there's a lot of improvement in that area but still needs to be much much higher than it is for 
us to really cultivate a manufacturing domestic as well as getting some foreign uh, companies to come in here to s not just sell products, laptops and desktops and servers and computers and storage devices, but manufacture them here. When they manufacture them here, we will create an ecosystem in, of both know-how, technology, skills, and learn a lot to be able to then sustain it in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, when we talk about this geopolitical situation, today we see that, especially in the semiconductor area, every country has created large investment programs to bring the semiconductor manufacturing locally. US Chips Act, EU has its own basically program, South Korea has a $200 billion investment program, Taiwan similarly, Japan similarly. So how do you think basically India, India's own semiconductor uh, mission will play in this global scenario where everybody is basically trying to build internal capacities. Uh, I named all the countries which are doing it, right? And I hear small countries like Morocco and all of those people are also thinking along the same line that I need semiconductor manufacturing in the country because it's such a strategic thing. So. Uh, how do you see India's semiconductor mission being successful in such a uh, volatile environment where everybody is trying to look inwards and build the semiconductor capabilities? Yes, I think uh, I call ISM India's semiconductor mission as mission impossible. The reason it's mission impossible is not just because suddenly all the world has become more nationalistic and they want to now, like US wants to grow all its semiconductors at home. Europe is again restarting to start bringing up fabs at home. And we are beginning to start just about the time when all these people are waking up to say we want to do it ourselves. So there's a extra barrier to getting us going. On top of the fact that we are 50 years late to coming into this party. The chip industry started 50 years ago. It's gone through several generations of evolution and learning and improvements and building ecosystem and skills. Everything you can think about it. We lack everything about it. And mostly we lack even what we had at the IT when these people suddenly realize in the perfect storm that we need someone like India to take care of our software need India was ready to receive them. When they came and knocked on Infosys door or Wipro door or TCS door, they were ready to accept the business, train their people with the universities that were created within these, their own campuses inside the enterprise. They created one year university program to take large diverse set of engineers from all over India, train them for whatever needs they had so that they can come on board in a very quick way. We do not even have a skilled semiconductor manpower today. If we had it today, my personal guess is a lot of people will be knocking on our door. The reason is even US and Taiwan doesn't have enough semiconductor engineers to do what they need to do in the next 10 years yes. to double the, the revenue from a half a trillion to a trillion dollar in semiconductors. So unfortunately, we got somewhat caught flat-footed. However, having said that, uh, from what I see, there's a tremendous focus on skill development. I'm myself visiting IIT Delhi. I was there and a lot of programs are starting across the board, a lot of training and skill training, both short term to take the existing engineers and give them very quick programs to become uh, viable and actually getting M-Tech and PhD students to uh, be trained in skills. But very it takes important. some time and so we have no choice. The way I look at it is mission impossible, may it be, but we have no choice but to be part of it and make it successful. So you mentioned mission impossible, right? Mission impossible became possible because Tom Cruise was basically driving it, right? Mission impossible for Indian space happened because somebody named Vikram Sarabhai came and set up the vision, right? and provide that basically iconic leadership which has basically long term vision strategy uh, the, and all the necessary ingredients right 
do you think basically to make India's semiconductor mission impossible to possible, do we need uh, somebody like Tom Cruise of Mission Impossible or Vikram Sarabhai of basically ISRO to really make it possible? Well, actually that would be the ideal situation because if you look at the Taiwan situation, Morris Chang actually made Taiwan semiconductors happen. And today TSMC is the world leader. And they then created a fantastic institution called ITRI that also helped to create capability in every part of semiconductors. So I think what we need definitely is a visionary person like Morris Chang to come here and also very deep need to create an ITRI type of an institution. It may take us long to do that. We should go and tie up with Taiwan and bring ITRI to India, work together with them, create all that capability in a very fast track manner. And there are enough global Indians who can match the aura and the magic of Morris Chang. So if we actually look around, we can find such people. But our, we should actually go around doing that rather than do a slow march towards growth. We should take the fast track approach. So rather than technology leadership, we need a visionary leadership. That's what you're saying, yeah. right, in some sense. Uh, you know, I think I would say uh, Ajay is completely right about it. But if you truly look at how the semiconductor industry became a dominant player in US, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Japan, governments in each of those countries played the most significant role in their success. And I'm glad to see that Indian government has finally stepped in to play a very significant role in success of the semiconductor industry here. And clearly, uh, since we are 50 years later, the Modi's Changs of India are much older than the Modi's Chang was when he left yes. US to go to Taiwan yeah. or when Vikram Sarabhai started his space research. Having said that though, I think there's enough dedicated people, I am one of them, who are absolutely willing to give every bit of what I can, uh, short of you know uh, what I will be constrained by physically because of my age, to make it successful. And we will need a lot of people on the ground here. We need youthness of ideas, not youthness of physical yeah. thing, right? We need. And you uh, see, one interesting part is that it's not just the central government. The state governments are also stepping up to provide support for semiconductors. Now, the, the US government is giving 30% benefit in terms of investments. India is giving 50% capital benefit. If you invest 10 million, government put, will put in 5 billion. But now state governments are saying, I'll put another 20%. Now, suddenly, somebody has to put up a, you know, a billion dollar plant or a $5 billion plant. They, they don't need to spend more than 30%. So I think it's extremely attractive. That's one part. The other attraction is the size of the Indian market. So I think there are some good things also going for the sure. semiconductor piece today, which will attract people. I think what we need is one or two good organizations to come in and invest here, and then others will follow. But I think that's something that we must yeah. look forward to. So, coming to investments and the incentives provided by the government, I believe when India created the PLI scheme sometime back, five to seven years back, uh, probably it was one of the best incentive scheme for electronics manufacturing industry because rest of the world was basically focusing on providing the incentive on the taxes and all of those things. But India provided the benefits on the amount you produce right which is direct benefit because sometime it takes five to seven years for companies to become profitable so if you give tax benefit it's basically not very good so do you think uh, the pli scheme especially in electronics manufacturing because we have now five years history for that has it served the intent for which it was created to jump start the India's electronics ecosystem. 
Absolutely. I think it's a terrific scheme because uh, I think uh, for many years, good schemes were being looked around. But the disability factors of India were actually coming in the way. The PLI scheme removes a lot of the disability factors and I think pushes people to perform. And against this performance is when they get the incentives. So I think it's an excellent scheme. Uh, I think they missed out a few pieces there. But even then, it's a terrific scheme. And it is a scheme around which we have actually seen manufacturing move in quite a big way. Today, India is one of the largest producers of smartphones in the world. That's all happened because of the PLI scheme. But we should have actually done a lot more. And I would go on to add that we should even do a lot more than we have. Yeah, the reason is the businesses, by definition, are risky. That is, the risk comes from the uncertainty in the business. The economy can change. For example, right now, for the last couple of years, like I just said, due to Russia-Ukraine war, energy prices, inflation due to COVID, a lot of businesses throughout the world are suffering. Nobody could have foreseen that say five, seven years ago before COVID happened. If you create uh, production link schemes, incentive schemes that are based on some rigid formula, then a business five years later may face a very uncertain situation, not be able to sustain it. So you have to allow some flexibility. It should be not so rigidly framed into uh, uh, the policy where you watch it, you observe it, and you work with the business and you modify it if need be, to get to where you want to get to, mutually working together. I think that will be one of my requests to the government is not to be so rigidly bureaucratic, but also dynamically be working with the business that is wanting to come in to really make it successful. That should be the end goal. From what I read um, about China uh, in the uh, 80s, late 70s and 80s, practically they didn't really have a uh, as sophisticated and intelligent bureaucracy like we have here. So they fundamentally gave vast lands, vast amount of electricity, vast amount of labor, vast amount of uh, water practically free for up to 30 years to say, please come in, set up and train our people, build your product, take them and sell them wherever you sell them so far at a lower cost than you do. Now, I'm not saying we should copy that in today's environment, but we need to have that type of a thinking if we want to get uh, large businesses. Because one of the things that I feel India lacks is large scale manufacturing. There are lots of small businesses, but manufacturing cannot happen in a cost effective way unless there's a large volume associated with manufacturing. And we do not have very large electronics manufacturing houses that I know of in the country today. Okay. I think that situation is but I very think fast one changing. One interesting thing that I would like yeah. to warn from what you mentioned, the flexibility part. I saw that happen recently in semiconductors, in the policy itself. The government decided that they will pass on 50% for all kinds of semiconductors. And I think that was a very quick decision taken by the government, which I believe that both the ministers, they understood the requirement yes. and they immediately acted upon it. Mm. And now we have become more uh, positive in terms of attracting more people to come here. Because whether it's ATMP or whether it's compound semiconductors or this display, how does it matter? Let's get everybody in today. We need everybody here. So analyzing the... India's progress in electronics manufacturing, okay. Typically, when we talk to industry people, almost everybody concur that electronics manufacturing, whatever 50-60% of our requirement we are manufacturing today, which was hardly 5 to 10% seven years back. So it's a fantastic progress. But when we look one level deeper, uh, it is seen that most of the activities are centered around EMS and assembly of the products, which in electronics or contract manufacturing for the electronics contribute about 8 to 12 percent value addition in this, right? And uh, those products are basically uh, being considered as a make in India 
category uh, where the intent of the maker in India was basically 50 percent value addition. So, how do we go from this 8 to 12 percent value addition to truly 50 percent or 40 percent value addition rather than some formula by which everybody is qualifying for 50 percent right. So, what changes we have to make in the uh, way the 50 percent value addition is calculated today to the point where it will really mean the real value addition not just a formula which qualifies everybody to 50 percent. So, I think question? the first uh, flexibility that needs to be brought in is to add to the PLI schemes of India. They have been introduced in many, many sectors, but not a single PLI scheme except telecom has a design element in it. So, if you should, if you actually incentivize de de design and value addition in India, the ball game will change. So, I think that is the change we need to bring about and government should be flexible enough to relook at the PLI scheme and change it. And in telecom, the minister took that initiative, created that scheme which has design as a part of it. I think that needed to be done for every part of electronics and actually every part of every PLI in this country. Because we now to be genuinely Atma Nirbhar Bharat, we need to be designing in India and buying components in India so that we do genuine value addition and not that 8 or 10 percent piece that we are doing today. So that, I, uh, I will add a little bit different uh, on top of what I just said. Of course, we should be doing that. If you just basically look at, say, an iPhone, then iPhone that sells for, say, $1,000 in the market. And I did this analysis recently, sat there till 4 a.m. in the morning because I was preparing a talk for IIT Delhi. And this data was not easily available. So I had to really extract it out and put it together. In that $1,000, the actual cost of components in the iPhone was $500. The $500 was the profit minus marketing, sales or some overhead that the bulk of that 50% left was all taken mm -hmm. by Apple. In the remaining 50%, that $500, there were liquid crystal displays, there were SOC chips, there were components, there was RF, there were sensors, all and there were a variety of companies supplying those things at cost to uh, Foxconn, which is the one who assembles it. The actual amount of money made by Foxconn, which is a value add, was less than 5 percent, 24 dollars or something, out of the 500 dollars. So if you look at that picture and answer your question, then it comes back to saying we need to own more of the intellectual property. The reason Apple makes that bulk of the money is because it's the only place, only thing that's done for iPhone in the world in Cupertino is the design. Yeah. Everything else is done everywhere else. Yeah. They don't do nothing including the steel casing. So if we can add in India and we will with time intellectual property, some innovation, some design capability, it doesn't really have to be all material based. For example, if an iPhone is done in India, which uh, is meant for our local people, where, for example, some Aadhaar type of thing is built into it, or payment is built into it, our wallet, our way of doing things, not necessarily American way of doing things, or repairability is built into it. So you can open the phone and do some extent repairability and extend its life. It could take off, and like I just said, then you have a local manufacturer making significant amount of margin and profit so, out of so that. So both of you are saying if you have to go from this 8 to 10 percent value addition to real 50 percent value addition, the design and product ownership can add some 30, 40 percent more Absolutely. and really make it 50 percent value Absolutely. addition in the country. Absolutely. And also if you own the product and the uh, brand and the IP, then it makes us really self-reliant. One part is value addition and once you own the product, then you basically have the 
complete control over the destiny of the product. See, look at how China created brands. They have the best brands today in smartphones. And they really rule the world. But how did they start? Actually, Taiwan helped them create this whole thing. Taiwan helped them to create designs. They taught them how to do designs. And then they added branding to it. And I think they have been very successful in terms of creating global brands. So India also needs to come in and try and create brands first in India and then go for global brands tomorrow. And that, for that, you need volume. You have to have the large manufacturing piece that Vinod talked about. And I think that's very essential. So we need to create a lot of champions in India who would be global-sized global brands as we go forward. So I think I want to tell you that one of the opportunities India has, because India has enormous talent. We only are talking about IT and electronics and technology. There's enormous talent in sciences. There's a talent in uh, healthcare, in medicine, right? If we look at a cross-disciplinary way, and you look at this phone, going forward, Apple's value add in this phone, these phones are no different than the phones that Ajay is talking about that are coming from China, right? Practically same in every regard. The only difference is what's on it, what's in it. And the reason I'm still buying that phone is because it can monitor your blood pressure, your heartbeat, it tells you to exercise. When your heart goes out of rhythm, it tells you, watch out. A lot of personal things that are extremely value added. Everybody in this world will pay an extra dollar for living longer or living healthier or things of that nature. All of the innovation in Apple now is going into healthcare. Very few people know about it. Right. If India today even takes where everybody is left at and starts integrating the new ideas, we have unique issues within India. Diabetes is a big issue in India, right? If you start putting some way of people improving their diabetic life or how they take the medicine or regularity of it or extend their life, I bet people will buy an Indian phone over any other phone just because of that reason alone. So, uh, uh, we all are saying that basically product design and the brand creation is a very important part of making India's journey from manufacturing to product nation, right? Now, uh, one thing which we see in the current uh, ecosystem that uh, how do we build the component ecosystem in the country, right? And today, whatever manufacturing is happening in the country, uh, most of the components come as a kit from basically global headquarters of the companies to the local manufacturing partner. Means Oppo sends the kit from the Oppo China to Oppo India. Apple sends basically through a supplier the kit to Foxconn and basically Siri City and so on and so forth. So, uh, if we estimate that we are making about 150 billion dollar of electronics today in the country, uh, the local purchase of the components is hardly 7 to 10 percent of that. So, it is hardly basically 10 billion dollars and that does not basically create a conducive environment for creating the local ecosystem. So, how do we change from basically getting all the uh, components which go into electronics product coming as a kit from basically global headquarters to a local purchase where the PO is issued by a local entity to the global semiconductor companies and basically global suppliers of the display, global suppliers of the battery. Right now, we do not have any influence on them because we are just getting kits from somebody who is procuring them in China and then basically shipping it to India. So, but if the purchase does not happen in India, then the global players do not basically consider that to be a serious sales opportunity for India. So, uh, how do we change this situation through design, through product creation and other means? I think it will finally happen through creating our own brands. If India becomes a location where people start to create brands and also just the way 
people used to go to china get a design done get manufacturing done bring it back put their own brand on it and sell it that opportunity exists for india today so i think that is where a lot of these changes will take place and i think very critically we need to also start to look at creating a very deep component ecosystem the component ecosystem in this country is very weak today and the initial effort that was put in creating the e component ecosystem needs to be dramatically improved what we must realize in our pli schemes and these kind of schemes is that they are aimed at large companies and medium companies they are not meant for the typical smes who actually make components globally so i think we need to create schemes for these smes and we need to be very specific and identify the 200 or 400 components that we need for the industry and go and pick those companies and bring them to india and get those components made number 1 number 2 if we start to design products in india we will source from india if we don't design products from india we are not going to source from india and the kits will keep coming what we are saying and a lot of other people are also saying the first step to build a component ecosystem is first to start buying the components from india today the buying does not happen from india so that nobody is interested in building the component in india because there is no buyer right because oppo is not going to buy from indian company they are going to get it as a kit right or vivo is going to get it as a kit so what you are saying and probably we know also agrees that we need to start incentivizing the purchase of the component from india through a local po and basically uh, preferably from the local manufacturers but even if you buy from the global manufacturer the purchase has to happen from india rather than coming as a package from somewhere you else this is the next thing it has to happen in parallel if you place a po then the person should be uh, um, able to give you what you need it's not that there should be a two two year delay in getting the component so like ajay said we need to have the components who are is making them to come here and start first making them here so we can actually buy them from here right and then we can have domestic players yeah. like small medium enterprise i'm not saying the manufacturing of the component is going to take time but today let's say if i have to uh uh look at mediatek for example right we are consuming lot of mediatek processors but that purchase is not happening through india so it's a global company it will take india to manufacture semiconductor some 5 7 years but even buying is not happening so mediatek processors are being used in india but there is hardly any purchase of mediatek processor from india because somebody sitting in china purchase those processors and send it to india right so i think the first step towards creating the local ecosystem of manufacturing the component is we have to first start buying first mm -hmm. and the buying will happen when we do the design as mm -hmm. you said right mm -hmm. am i correct in that there is another way of short circuiting this and the way it would be that we create large component warehouses which are duty free we have these complicated duty systems where you can only import pay duty and then import you create huge warehouses next to airports and create bring in global component companies to come and set up shop here they've done it in singapore why can't they do it in india india is a much bigger market so the regional component companies their housing is all in singapore they's not here we should move them here give them all the facilities give them incentives tell them zero duty you bring them here store them here and supply as the as the customer wants if it's just in time people will start buying from you so 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 if we start doing the local pos that will and incentivize the companies to put the local pos because people will not do it till you incentivize it right then that will automatically make the large companies to warehouse it because now the local pos are happening yeah. so local warehousing will also happen is that the right conjecture yeah yeah absolutely right absolutely right so uh, i think uh, uh, overall both of you agree that for the long term economic benefit security benefits and basically uh, taking india towards the 5 trillion dollar economy the product design product ownership at the electronics level which will also create the demand for semiconductor is 
time for such thing has come and we have to find basically ways to incentivize the product design. So, uh, India has done very good with the PLI in electronics and then semiconductor incentives. What can we do in specific terms to incentivize the design? What are the ways to incentivize the design? So, that basically people start taking the risk and putting because uh, it is not like manufacturing. In product design, if you try 5 products, maybe 3 of them will be successful. So, so, there is a risk element to it, right. So, what is the way India can create some incentive schemes to incentivize product design uh, and the brand creation? So, so, India has already created a scheme is called design link scheme. So, not product link, design link scheme. And it is a very uh, well thought out, broad based, uh, and I am now uh, one yeah, of the, I part of the scheme, basically to that. advising on that. Scheme. In there, one of the most fundamental things they have done is they have gone to Cadence, Synopsis, and Mentor and taken those tools, which are very, very expensive and created a network of accessible tools to any designer sitting anywhere in India to access that tool to start designing. That is the first step. So, if you have a computer and you have an idea and you want to get a tool to design, you can start designing. The only thing they have not yet done is to provide a cloud computing infrastructure so that you do not even have to worry about setting up a server to start your design team. So, if you're, you want to design a chip or you want to design a function or you design a component, you can today will get a kickstart right away from Government of India to get that process going. On top of that, for a seed stage investment going from series C to series A to B to C to D, at each step, the Government of India will give you up to 15 crores at each step to pay for your IT, to pay for labor, to pay for whatever you are doing without any equity or without any demand, which is really a very significant step in my opinion to encourage people to move in that direction. In addition, they have already uh, put into the library that can be accessed free of cost by any designer sitting in India, not only IPs that they have generated through Shakti and Risk Five or CDAC or whatever else they are doing, but even they have license from uh, ARM, in uh, which is the most popular process in the world, and they will be on the library where you can get the ARM, and not the most advanced ARM course, but the early ARM course to start designing things around it. So I'm saying there is a significant amount of activity for them, and then for medium, large scale companies also. There is now twice the amount, like 30 crores, that they can get to get the ball rolling. On top of that, they are giving some incentive of 6 percent or 8 percent to create a level playing field four between to six percent. 4 to 6 percent, level playing field between the local vendors and the uh, importers. We will come to semiconductors, yeah. but uh, if design of electronics products has to be incentivized because the uh, enabling factors are very different for semiconductors than electronics right and that is a very large basically opportunity. How do we structure an incentive scheme for electronics products? Uh, maybe we can take basically some of the ideas from the DLI scheme for the se uh, fabulous semiconductors, but how do we structure because electronics product will have a large component of the product design also right like mechanical and iPhone steel case and all those things which you talked about right. So, in what way we can structure the electronics incentivize scheme for product design? I think there are two three factors that needed to be taken care of. Our education system does not teach people how to make products. So, I think that is a major change that we need to bring. Do people understand that how to do design for bomb at the right cost, design for manufacturing, design for service, design for sustainability, design for repairability. All these issues are not taught in our education system. So, I think this is the first place we need to start 
And second thing that we need to do is to create a DLI scheme which is completely different from products because product is a very different ball game. Just the way Wynn talked about creating libraries, etc., etc., for the semiconductor piece, we also need to create similar environment all over the country. And we need to set up design houses all over the country to start designing products. Invite global design companies to set up product design capabilities here. Involve education and research into this whole effort so that they also look at product design as a very major piece. Because which IIT today teaches how to design a computer or how to design a phone? None. So I think that is where a major change needs to be brought around. And then the incentive schemes will start to kick in. Then you start doing government procurement by saying all that the government buys, 50% or 70% of that will be bought when you have 50% value addition in India and designed in India. Now, all these things need to be combined, put together, and a new scheme for design is created. Then we can be a terrific product nation. I, I would agree with everything I just said here and add on to give you an example. For example, in a semiconductor, you have to make a chip, a proof of concept, which is very expensive to go through a fabrication process. Yeah, yeah. But the government of India is now picking up the bill for doing that by letting 500 chips be located into of different chips in which same wafer uh, in a foundry and pay for just your portion of it. Why can't they do the same thing or why can't we do the same thing for PCB, for example? If a designer walks in and he's trained and he wants PCB to design... PCB is hardly any a, cost, right? No, not just a cost. He may need uh, to go through iteration. He may need access to the tools for design. He may need access to the materials for design. I think we can offer a lot of help. See, that's why I'm referring in the semiconductors, the design tools and the basically access to the fab and access to IP is basically major portion of the proof of concept product, right? But electronics is a very different basically kind of the cost factor when I do electronics product, right? The same factors and that's why I'm uh, laboring this point is that we have done a very good DLI scheme and basically I was early part of the discussion of those schemes. But how do we take that and basically create a new scheme because the driving factor for electronics products are very different. Yeah, I mentioned that, that you know, you need to do something similar like what has been done in DLI. For example, in the product area, you also need to provide facilities to all these product uh, startups and product companies to be able to have mechanical design, plastics design, all this integrated into creating a capability set which is available at these design centers. So, no, where you are putting a cadence tool, you need to also put all these kind of facilities which will actually make a product happen end to end. Today, it's not just about designing the motherboard or designing the software. It's all about mechanical and plastics also because the product has to be made to look good. And aesthetics are very important in any product. So I think a lot of these facilities need to be provided at various locations in the country and in addition provide certification capabilities so that today a guy who actually designs a product has no place to go to for certification. If you want, if you for example create a medtech device and you want it uh, proven that it works in India, there is no lab in India which will say, give me that device, I'll do, do it in three months and give it back to you and I'll certify that it works. So these are all additions that we need to do when we look at product design. So like what we did in VL, DLI, we said 50% of all your expenses for development other than infrastructure piece will be taken care by the government in form of the reimbursement. Do you think a similar basically concept will mm -hmm. work for electronics products mm -hmm. also? But here we should be clear on what we want to do. So we should identify the top 100 products or top 150 products which we want to focus on. Today 80% of medtech electronics is imported. So we should say, okay, these are the 50 products that we want to go after. And all these products, 50 products will be incentivized. Then you do a focused activity on getting products designed in India. So, uh, kind of uh, 
taking that point forward what I hear from the China what they did is exactly the same right. They did not say we are going to create a future innovative product they said this is the product which is needed today will create the focused basically attention on these products whether it is a chip product and I will come to that in a minute or electronics product and we will just basically start designing and manufacturing them basically in the country. Uh, so, I do not think the Chinese even did that I think Chinese just laid out a red carpet for USA after Nixon uh, visited and signed that uh, uh, deal to say we will open up the market for anyone and everyone to walk in to make microwaves, refrigerators, dishwashers, washers, dryers, you know uh, your blood pressure equipment, your no, metronic things they, they said come do it that was and the in the process they have learned they have created a whole industry which is now serving their local needs. No that was the manufacturing piece but post that they said that okay we have to basically make a Wi-Fi router we will make a same copy of Wi-Fi router which Cisco is making. Much right? easier to do by the way if you have 10,000 people who have been doing it day in day yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, That is the thing you need to remember. Yeah, yeah. It is not like they did it in vacuum. They did it where they had thousands of people for 10 year building routers for uh, uh, Cisco and then somebody in Huawei said let us just copy it and, yeah, do it yeah. and build a company. So, you need yeah. to keep uh, in mind how China came about. It was really free for all just build world's largest manufacturing in one country it is you know it is producing 60 percent of world's needs yeah, yeah. it is a very different ball game. Yeah, but uh, uh, so what you said is focus on basically 50 or 100 important impactful high volume products and start de designing them in India as a start, uh, as a start, as start and then from there you can do more basically 200, 500, 500, 000, 000, so on and so forth right. Uh, so, I think uh, we are coming to the end of this conversation. Um, would like to get your overall strategy, incentives, whatever we have to do to move from a the whole discourse in the country has to move from manufacturing to product I think all of us agree because that is the going to be the real driver because anywhere we go today the talk is only manufacturing and in electronics you know manufacturing is a low value added addition and it is assembly and EMS and so on and so forth. So, do you agree that the discourse has to move from manufacturing to products then we start talking in government forums, industry association uh, forums and all of those things about products which will drive the manufacturing also, but the discourse has to change from manufacturing to products. Do you Same thing has happened in software. We started out in the software services industry. We have done brilliantly. Last 10 years the, the discourse has changed from just services to product development. Everybody in India used to ask why do not we have a Google in India? Why do not we have a Microsoft in India? It is not going to happen unless you actually put some effort behind it. NASCOM started that effort, a think tank called iSpirit went after it. In the last 8 to 10 years, you have started seeing global Indian software products. So, I think that same discourse has to happen and same attention to creating this kind of an organization and a capability is required to make India a product nation. And I think right through the government, right through the industry, there has to be deep uh, creation of capability sets, education, research which I talked about, creating of environment for making products and then creating a market for these products in India. The best way to create markets in these products is to my mind look at just government procurement. Open it up to startups, open it up to all companies and say if you design in India we will give you the benefit of buying from the government. Today for example, just look at uh, UP government, they want to buy 20 million tablets. I mean they are going to buy 20 million tablets, they are going to spend money on it. Why do not they buy Indian product? Why do not they buy a product that is designed and manufactured in India? Even if it is manufactured in India by a global company, go ahead and buy it. But give benefit to the companies that are actually manufacturing here. You can change the complete uh, uh, complexion of the volume of India 
very easily because India is buying a lot of electronics. And I think that change needs to be brought around. But not only change the volume, if we make it a nation of products, yes. that's what the margin of profit will more than double. It'll skyrocket. Yes. It'll go from like Foxconn is making 70-10% to what Apple is making 50-60%. So if, if you look at the EBITDA of basically any EMS company, it is somewhere around 3 to 4%. Yeah. Look at Foxconn. Yeah. You know, it's a contract manufacturer. It's very low profit margin. If you do product design, suddenly your profit margin will become significant. And we are, there are examples happening in India right this yes. moment. Yes. Companies like Boat and Noise have come up. Initially, they started getting designs done in China, etc., etc. They're now moving their designs to India. And their margins will dramatically improve. Yes. And uh, there's no harm in starting wherever they're starting from. Yes. Question is where you are going. Right. And where we want to go is to really build a, like he said, very well put it, Satya did, a product nation, yes. not just a benefit. So, so a uh, lot of people say product designing like uh, things is very expensive. So, I'll ask you a very pointed question. If we have to do a India cell phone as a product, not as a chip or anything, just a product which is equivalent to Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, what kind of investment may be needed to create a product which will be using global component and now the designs are more or less standard as you said, right? That there's hardly any difference in a design between Oppo and iPhone, right? In your estimate, how much money and effort it will take to create a globally competitive in terms of the features, look and feel and the price to create a mobile phone from India, India design, India manufactured. It's not just a question of cost, Satya. I think we need to look long term. If we design one product, we need to keep designing family of these products over a period of time. So I think that's where the uh, strategy has to be developed by different companies who want to create products. Many years ago, I think this was about 20, 30, 25 years ago, I did a program for the government, which I was called Carol. And I looked at a list of products that we should design from scratch. And I went to the whole industry and said, why can't we all get together and design an India's smartphone, an India tablet, and an India laptop, and all of that. The government agreed. But then everything sort of fell apart and uh, people changed in, the, in Meti and people didn't take it forward. If we had done that 20 years ago, we would be a product nation today. So I think it's just a question of focus. So I ask this question because there is a lot of uh, uh, myth about that it so, takes hundreds so of let millions of dollars. Let me answer right? that question. Just one second. This Oppo phone that you keep on talking about, how much does it cost to buy in India? Can you tell me it that? It costs about 18,000 rupees. 18,000 rupees. Then you can build a phone in India for nine thousand rupees and sell it for ten thousand, and still be profitable highly if you d start designing the kind of things value so add he's talking about, because that will not cost more hardware cost. Those are value adds that are coming from application, yeah. so you can literally be mm. very profitable. And if you are like uh, 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 Ambani's are in communication, also you can merge various services together. Literally, your cost of building becomes very secondary. What is important is the value you're providing to the customer. Really and that becomes the most important. So, so 10,000 rupees is your cost. features like what we talked about earlier, repairability and, yeah. and sustainability yeah. and ensure that we don't have huge amount of e-waste being created in India. You so 10,000 rupees is what, $100 is it? Am I doing my 10, math correctly? 10,000 rupees is uh, 1,200. Yeah, it'll be very soon 100 if the economies yeah. go the way uh, we do. So, so $100 uh, will be your cost. That's the answer to your own question. Yeah. See, I asked that specific cost question. Cost of development, Satya, will not be more than a couple of million dollars. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. Because, nothing. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you because through Epic Foundation, you are trying to design a completely India design, India made basically tablet, right? Which will have a complete hardware and software ownership in India. And you would have some estimate that how much money it takes. If I translate that into phone, which is slightly more complicated device, do you think a $10 million investment can create a globally competitive, in all aspects, phone from India? Very easily. 
maybe you don't even need to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think if you start to think about what Vin was talking about, adding value from India, creating Indian software, creating Indian uh, you know, education software, health software, all of that, and you bundle that in the product and make it very Indian and put Aadhaar Connect directly, you may have something so unique that nobody will be able to uh, do something. So it's not just the money, it's all our imagination. And, and, and let so me share something. The myth is that it takes a lot of investment no. into and this And let thing. me share something yeah. else unique about India. India is one of the only few countries in the world that have talent both in software and if we do this product in design. That's very rare. One of the reasons why Japan did not keep up in semiconductors because they were very, very good in micro miniaturization and hardware. But when the industry moved to software operating systems and biases and applications, mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. really not keeping up, whether it was the language was the issue or whatever, I do not know, but they couldn't keep up and they moved away from it. Same thing you see in Korea. They are very good in hardware, by the way, because DRAMs and all these NANDs and things say, these are all hardware chips. Moment you go into software, these countries are not as good as we are, fortunately. So if we can combine these two, we can absolutely blow we the world away. We can be world beaters absolutely. if we combine hardware and no software. Doubt about and it. We, no uh, doubt about it. We can really rule the world in, we the, can. in the business of products. Definitely we can. So, uh, to coming to the end of the this discussion and very interesting and lively fireside chat. Uh, I think from both of your inputs, I think we have all the ingredients to make India as a product nation. We have to just bring all the different silos of expertise together like manufacturing, manpower, three mass which we talked in the beginning right manufacturing market and basically manpower and basically put a recipe with some investment which is not very used as you said 10 million dollars is good enough to create a cell phone and 1 million dollar may be good enough to create a tablet right we can basically very successfully convert India from a manufacturing hub to a product hub in the next 5 to 7 years. So it's manufacturing to product and software services to product. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the direction for us. Because in each case, there's a value add, yeah. which is what we are looking for. Sure. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, this is the first edition of the Epic Conversation. We'll bring you more such interesting conversation, strategy, and in-depth understanding of complete ecosystem, uh, how to build India as a product nation from various different angles, various global experts will bring you to the table. Thank you Vinod, thank you Ajay for basically sharing this one hour and very important topic for the India. Thank you Satya. Thank you.